Hello and welcome to the Fancy News Show from the Bottled Imp. My name is Ken Boyter and this is your weekly fix of fantasy goodness. On this week's show, Monster! Nosferatu is returning once again. An anime legend is also returning, but this time it's work. And we hear demon voices. But first, the National Toy Hall of Fame in the US of A has inducted the classic role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons. Now, that was that's a game, a role-playing game that was really designed by Gary Gyax and Dave Arneson. And it was first published in 1974, so it's basically over 40 years old. And it was published by Tactical Studies Rules back in the day. And it's grown massively in those 40 years. And it was also widely recognised as being the modern role-playing uh, game, you know, the start of how all these role-playing games started. And also, you know, set up the role-playing industry, because previous to that, there wasn't really much of a role-playing industry. And the first basic set was released in 1977, and it still is the market leader. Wizards of the Coasts have been publishing the game since 1997, and it was de derived from derived <laughs> derived from the miniature war games uh, industry that was ca carrying on at that point. And there was a game called Chainmail, so it was kind of taken from a game called Chainmail, and then you know they built upon that, and they were using the initial rule system from Chainmail. Now, in its fifth edition, players, what happens is players, you create your own characters and basically you roll dice to determine your statistics and you can power up, you level up and you basically walk through a story and, and it's a story-based game play, if that makes sense. And one player is the Dungeon Master and they're going to be the sort of person that leads the story. Now, I've just started recently playing it and I absolutely love it and we have done a fifth edition the starter set uh, review, so you can check that out on our channel. And the Hall of Fame in America was created by The Strong, which is an interactive collections-based museum devoted to the history and explanation of play, and it's based in Manhattan Square in downtown Rochester in New York. And I have been to New York, nearly got mugged there, but that's a whole different story. To find out more about the information, uh, the museum and the Toy Hall of Fame, you can visit museumofplay.org and we will be putting all the links in the description of this episode. The witch director, Robert Eggers, is set to direct the new Nosferatu. <laughs> I knew I couldn't say it. I say it off camera so well. Nof Nosferatu. Yeah, no, that is it, isn't it? <laughs> Nof Nosferatu. Nos Nosferatu. 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 That's the one. Nosferatu. Nosferatu. Nos I think I'm annoying myself now. Anyway, the director has confirmed that the uh, on the Filmmaker Toolkit podcast that his next film will be the remake of the all-time classic German vampire movie that was released way back in 1922. Eggers said, it's shocking to me, it feels ugly and blasphemous and egomanical and disgusting for a filmmaker in my place to do Nostravatu next. I was really planning on waiting a while, but that is how fake shook, fate shook out. Which is fair enough, I guess, you know, if he's been offered this chance to do it at this point in his career. I certainly wouldn't turn down that opportunity. Uh, Werner Herx uh, remade Nosferatu back in the 70s, which was well received at the time, but the original film, which was directed by German film director F.W. Menu, remains the definitive version. And, you know, I really must get round to doing a review of it. Maybe the new Robert Eggers version will give the old version a run for its money. Anime legend Heio Miseratu, and I'm sure I've completely mis... I didn't even bother trying to pronounce that. <laughs> Miyazaki, Heio Miyazaki, I think that's it. Anyway, he is a bit bored at the moment, and he's coming out of retirement to make another feature film. The Japanese, uh, Japanese animation studio, Studio Ghibli, <laughs> again, if that's how you pronounce it, was started by the anime legend way back 30 years ago. And they have made some of the greatest animated movies of all time. And just three years after announcing his retirement, he is back and he wants to make another feature film. The film is called Borrow the Caterpillar and has been in development for nearly 20 years. And it's described simply as the story of a tiny hairy caterpillar, so tiny that it may be easily squashed between your fingers. 
Sounds intriguing. Now, I love this news um, because I've only recently discovered here at The Bottled Imp his films and Studio Ghibli's films. Uh, we started out by reviewing Howl's Moving Castle. We, you can check that out. Yeah, I, well, I'll let you into a little secret there. I absolutely adored it. It was fantastic. So I do aim, now that, you know, hopefully by the time this new film comes out, I'll have watched all of their films and done the reviews too. There is a new Beauty and the Beast trailer online right now. Disney's live action romantic fantasy film of the classic fairy tale of the same title has uh, released their trailer for the upcoming film Beauty and the Beast. The original story was written by the French novelist Gabrielle Suzanne Bardot de Villeneuve and published in 1740. If it's a classic story, if it's a good story, it will never die. Disney adapted this story originally in 1991. Uh, they did an animated version, which was directed by Kirk Wise, as I'm sure you all know. And this version stars Harry Potter actress Emma Watson as Belle and Dan Stevens, who was from Downton Abbey, as the Beast. The film does look absolutely stunning. I do recommend you check out this trailer. It's obviously a big, glossy, you know, they've spent masses of money on this. It's a big epic full of songs and I'm assuming dancing. I think it's going to be amazing. And it is one of these films that I th it is beautiful that you can take all your family. It's one of those shared experiences. And the film is set for a March release next year. And you can catch the new trailer at their website, which is disney.co.uk or obviously on the YouTube. David Flicking, oh, Ficking, careful I say that, David Ficking books is to release essays by Philip Pullman on storytelling. Really excited about this. In the book Demon Voices, Essays on Storytelling, which is a collection of Philip Pullman's previously published articles and essays about these stories and the art of storytelling, that's going to be published next year. In his first non-fiction title, Pullman explores his own craft as well as looking at the art behind other stories such as Oliver Twist and Paradise Lost. Presenting the book at a showcase uh, yesterday somewhere, I couldn't find out where it was, but anyway, um, I think it was in London. Pullman said that one of the articles in his book was inspired by an interview he read with Richard Dawkins where Dawkins expressed concern uh, over fairy tales giving children, bless you, <laughs> Julian just sneezed. So yeah, Dawkins expressed concern over fairy tales uh, giving children a false belief in magic. Really? Seriously, Dawkins? Belief is just the fundamental thing of being a human. Philip Pullman said, I started to think about whether children believe in what they read, in fairy tales or not, and I think reading is playing or pretending. I used to pretend to be Davy Crockett, but I always knew I wasn't him. By playing out what I'd seen on the screen, my mind experienced the heroism that, and what it was like to be brave. Those experiences are part of our moral education. Hear, hear. Totally agree with that. So I am very excited about this, as I say, because Philip Pullman is one of the UK's finest writers with such books as his Dark Materials trilogy, the Sally Lockhart series and the New Cut Gang books. And I really, really must get round to reviewing his dark materials. Hmm, maybe next year. Nightmare's Realm, New Tales of the Weird and Fantastic, is due for release uh, and it's edited by S.T. Joshia. Um, it's got cover artwork by Samuel Ayra, if that's how you pronounce it. The fantasy horror short collection features 100% original fiction focusing on the theme of dreams and nightmares. Ooh, sounds scary. Authors include Ramsey Campbell, John Shirley, Kathleen R. Kermanen, John Langang, Simon Stratus, Nancy Kilpatrick, W.H. Permeyer. And there are 17 new stories with a prologue by H.P. Lovecraft and epilogue by Alan Agapo. Dark Regions Press are also printing a deluxe slipcase hardcover limited edition that is signed by the editor and the artist and all the authors, as well as being bound in black leather. Sounds fantastic. The work will be available to buy on the 22nd of November. You can check out their website to find out more about the book and how to purchase it at www.darkregions.com. I think I've had too much coffee this morning. Anyway, Kickstarter news. A Dark Forest, issue four, is a dark Gothic graphic novel by Kate Meyer White. 
The three previous issues were successfully funded on Kickstarter and the story is about two sisters, Elizabeth and Grace, and their childhood set in a mysterious forest. Love this idea. Suspicions in the town rise with further disturbing events unfolding around the story's characters. The story is influenced by dark folk tales, fairy tales, myths and legends. A Dark Forest is to be a graphic novel series of seven issues. Each comic is hand bound. Can you believe that? She hand binds these. 16 pages and it's an A5 UK size. And the original drawings that she does are all hand drawn in pen and ink as well. The drawings do look amazing, they look really exquisite, very detailed, and they do look like uh, woodcuts, which I absolutely adore. And you can see several of the panels there on the Kickstarter page, plus there are several reward levels and pledge levels, and there are a few reviews of the previous ones to read as well. It's already funded and finishes on the 11th of December. Tiny Epic Quest by Gameling Games is the latest in their timey, timey, timey wimey, their Tiny Epic series. The Tiny Epic Quest is an open world tile laying game for one to four players with action selection, grid movement, and push your luck game mechanics. It plays between 30 and 45 minutes, and it's a really exciting thing though. This is, <laughs> hey, this is exciting. The Meeples hold equipment. Yes! You can, uh, you can equip them up with like little tiny crossbows and little swords and shields. That's a brilliant idea. Um, there are loads of components to this game and they all fit into a tiny little box that does fit into your pocket, apparently. I'm not sure how big your pockets have to be, but apparently it does fit in your pocket. In Tiny Epic Quest, a world of peace has been torn asunder by o the opening of a veil portal from the Goblin Kingdom. Ooh. And nasty goblins pour into the villages of the elf world, setting the realm ablaze. Players must quest in order to right what has gone wrong. There are two paths to victory, closing the portal or slaying all the goblins. Gamelin Games have produced several previous Tiny Epic games, such as Tiny Epic Defenders, Tiny Epic Western, and Tiny Epic Kingdoms. So they've plenty of experience in publishing game. Zzz. Didn't put the S on that word there. There are clear and detailed rules and there are a few reviews as well so you can see how the game plays. There are lots of stretch goals and reviews um, and many of them have been already unlocked. It's already funded and it finishes on the 27th of November. The Game Anywhere table is a table that lets you, well, game anywhere. It's a gaming table designed by Transforming Games that takes up to six players and is portable, customizable table that is lightweight and storable too. It all folds down pretty small. The size of the table when open is 50 inches long by 46 inches wide, has a movable player accessories that, such as player dividers, you know, component holders, They've even got drinks holders as well. And all the stuff that's on the table can be ma uh, is magnetic, so it doesn't move around. It's got a felt table too, and it takes about five, you know, maybe five to ten minutes to set up. It looks really easy. They've got lots of videos explaining how they open up the table, how you can set it all up. And it does look really amazing, this is, because if, you know, there are some previous gaming tables, you know, like uh, uh, Chic, I think, is one of them. And they, the Geek Chic table, I think, and that, they're permanent, as in you can't fold them all away. This, though, folds down. So obviously if you're gaming on the move, you take it to your friend's house, that's fantastic. Or if you're limited for space, this would be a good gaming table for that as well. It's already funded with many of the stretch goals unlocked, and it finishes on the 3rd of December. <sighs> and relax because that's all we have time for remember we do have a friday fantasy show as well where we do lots of different reviews of different fantasy things thank you so much for subscribing uh, if you haven't subscribed please do and please 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 shit that sounded like i was begging there well i am because we want to grow bigger and bigger and remember until next time fellow imps keep it unreal especially if you like fantasy just the classic line. Don't need to elaborate on that. Yeah.